Uh, now that my wife has taken up all my speech time. Thank you, Barb. You're welcome. I just want to say our police chief says, has told me that this is the best common pleas judge in Hamilton County. Our one and only Megan Shanahan. Would you come up, Thank Megan? I was so touched, Chief Hines texted me earlier and explained that he's partying down in Gatlinburg, so couldn't be here. But uh, he's a good, good man and a, a longtime friend. Uh, I'm Megan Shanahan, and I am one of your Common Pleas judges. First, I want to thank Mayor Paula Castro for inviting me to come here tonight. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself to you all. Some of you we've met quite a few times in the past. I ran um, back in 2010, I think I came and I spoke that year, and then maybe again in 11 when I ran. And so I wanted to come and tell you a little bit about myself, what we do as common police court judges, and why I'd like you to vote for me and consider me on the November ballot. Um, I am the youngest of eight children. I was raised by a single mother, and there was never an option of if you were going to college. It was just where are you going to college, and how are you going to pay for it? Because obviously there was no money. And she was dead set on all of us having a better life than she did. She instilled that into us from day one. And she was not a terribly political person per se, but she understood the importance of being a good American. So every year, whatever, the youngest, I was the youngest of eight. So I was always drug along outworking the polls every year. It was ingrained in us. And it wasn't politics. It was this is what you do as a citizen of this country. You give back. You believe in something. You back something. So I was fortunate to have that upbringing, you know, despite, you know, the, the strikes against us as such a large family with a single parent. Um, it, we were just very, very, very lucky to have such a strong mother. So I ultimately did go, obviously, to college up at Kent State and then to law school at the University of Cincinnati. And when I graduated law school, the only thing I did not want to do was criminal law. I had been in, an intern at a medical malpractice firm and absolutely loved it, and that was my plan. And on a complete whim, I literally had already taken a job at the Midland Group, and the Butler County Prosecutor's Office called me and asked me to interview. And I thought, oh, I'll just go for interview practice. And the office was in complete upheaval. Their, <coughs> their prosecutor dropped dead at the racetrack in Kentucky. So the, his first assistant had to pick up the reins um, for an election in November, and he took over in September to run for a November election. So I jumped into this job. I have no idea what possessed me to take it. I took the job. The Midland Group said you would have been a full not to because you want to be a trial lawyer, and you'll get that experience. And I did. In the course of my 11 years as a prosecutor, five up there in Butler County, and then Joe Dieters brought me back here to Hamilton County. He is, was an old friend of mine. Um, I tried in excess of 50 jury trials in the Common Pleas Court, the court where I am now a judge. So I have quite a bit of experience. It's rare to um, have the fortune of having done that much litigation. And these are serious situations. I was the prosecutor on the Delhi dismemberment case, the man that had cut up his wife and drove around the county disposing of her with their three um, handicapped children in the car and got a conviction on that case. I handled everything from death penalties down to, you know, the drug possessions. And on the drug possession note, you know, it, it, it's here. Here we are. It's in Marymount. My girlfriend called me last week because her niece OD'd in the park here twice in a week, twice had to be Narcan back. These are the problems that we face as judges. And I feel that it's my duty to be involved to the extent I'm permitted on the bench by trying to provide some help to our community so we can get through these issues, so we can get past these issues and so that we have a safe community, frankly. Um, you know, there are some people that need to go to prison for a very, very long time. And then on the flip side of that, I'm one of only two judges in the Common Pleas Court that has a mental health court docket. I volunteered for it. 
I would venture a guess that everybody in this room knows somebody or is related to somebody that suffers from mental illness, whether it's something that's controlled by medication or not. And the people that I deal with, my clients, are um, felony convicts who are mentally ill, and largely they are self-medicating with heroin, and they want out, and they want help. And we literally provide them the tools to get a home, to get a job, to get clean. They're plugged in with Greater Cincinnati, Cincinnati Behavioral Health. They are given a case manager. We get their Medicaid lined up, their Social Security if they're entitled to that. We get their medicines. We literally have nurses that keep their medicines when they're not quite ready to be on their own. And they have to come see a nurse every day and just get that day's medicine. It's an incredible team approach to doing something about the mental health and the drug ep epidemic in our community. So I get that benefit of, of not just being the you know, law and order judge, but also to help to give back to some folks that really have no way out and would just be in the revolving door of our system, of our prison system. Um, I genuinely love, love, love what I do. Uh, when I ran in 2010, I took on a 28 year incumbent I was told there was no way, there was no way I would unseat her, and I came within four percentage points of beating her, because I never for one minute believed that I couldn't. And so in 2011, same situation, I turned around and immediately ran in a district race that included Marymont. And thanks to a lot of the folks in Marymont, um, I carried 61% of the vote and became a municipal court judge. And that is the, the lower court handling DUIs, domestic violence, those types of things where you can only go to the county jail. In 13, I was unopposed and I had a six year term and I could have sat as a judge in municipal court safely until 2019, I wouldn't have to run. But in 2015, when Ted Winkler went over to um, the probate court, his seat opened up and I jumped at the opportunity for an appointment back to Common Pleas where I'd spent my entire career as a prosecutor. It's an intense job. I'm starting a capital murder case tomorrow. The, the victim is a two-year-old baby. Um, I have the University of Cincinnati police officer case starting October 25th. That will be mine. It is intense and I love every minute of it. I do. We handle the civil cases as well. Um, all these landslides that have happened over the years down on Columbia Parkway, uh, that all comes to litigation. Who's responsible for things like that? People forget about it when the traffic's cleaned up, but I handled one of those cases last year. It's just, it's a very interesting job. I'm blessed to have it. Um, I'm, I have a three-year-old son and I'm due three weeks after the election and I still love my job. I love my kids, I love my family, but I love my job. It's just, it is so rewarding to get to do it all and have it all. And um, I'm not going to let it be taken away from me. I just, I really, I really enjoy being a part of this community and being in a position where I can make a difference and give back. So that is why I'm running. Any questions? Yes. I have a question on this heroin thing. That I know that there's been some talk about moving the uh, effort to the drug dealers and prosecuting them for the loss of life. Yes. Set as much the same way we prosecute a drunk driver or somebody who shoots someone with a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that can, can get traction and actually be effective? I think it's um, a lot like taking, a, scooping a water out of Lake Erie with a teaspoon. There's always going to be another one is the problem. I mean, it's just such a lucrative business. Um, I think that it's, we have to try everything. I don't think it's, you know, a, a futile effort. I've had two of those cases so far in front of me where people have overdosed on the highway, caused major accidents. Nobody. Neither of the cases that I have was somebody, did somebody die, um, but the drug dealers were charged. It's, um, there's always another one. It's just it's so lucrative. But we'll try anything. I mean, whatever angle we can take to try and make this stop. 
is uh, help me understand are you in a district I am uh, not. It's, it's um, open to the whole county. It is this time, and it, it's a countywide race. All of the common pleas races are countywide. Uh, there are 16 common pleas court judges, and uh, I do have an opponent. Not everybody does. That's up for election this year, but it, we are all countywide. In the odd number of years is when you see district races for judge. So in 11 and in 13, I was on your ballot because Marymount was my district, Judicial District 4. And it was, it's the eastern um, part of the county, the southeastern part of the county is the Judicial District 4 where you live. So if you win, how long is the term, four or six years? This one, because Ted Winkler vacated this seat, I would normally only win the balance of his term. And I would have to turn around and run again but it just so happened, I got lucky enough, he was naturally up this year anyway, Ted Winkler. So because I, I was appointed to his seat last April, so I've been in the, in the position the governor appointed me last April. Um, but because he would have had to run this year had he stayed in this seat, <coughs> I am running for a full term for okay. full six years. For so, six years? sorry, oh, okay. yeah, that was a very lawyerly long answer. <laughs> <laughs> six years is the answer. <laughs> But it's not always like that. That's why, like I said, when I ran in 11, I unseated an appointee, and I had to turn around and run again in 13, and then that was a six-year term that I had won that. Okay. Who are you running against? I don't even know. I've never heard of this person. Well, I always like to say he's running against me, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're splitting hairs. His, his, the number one rule in politics is you never say your opponent's name, but I always answer the question, because I think, it irritates people if I said to you, well, I can't say his name. I mean, that's just silly. Yeah. His name is Albertus Bishop. Um, he's a 63-year-old African-American man who's been a lawyer um, for a long time, but he does not do a lot of common pleas practice. In the past year, he has handled four cases in common pleas, two of which were in domestic relations court, and one he was representing his wife on a collection issue. So. He doesn't do a, he, he's a very, very talented musician, and um, that's really the main focus of his work. He, he is the music director at a large church in town. And are there any polls out there? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You can run Cynthia, online. go ahead. I don't want to. <laughs> you can, I don't know a lot about the court system, and this may be a really kind of stupid question, but tomorrow when you start this capital murder case, is that the only thing you will do until it's resolved? Or would you be kind of spraying yourself in and address some other issues that come through the court system? What we try to do on the, and that's not a stupid question at all, because people always think we handle one case at a time. I have um, probably 600 cases pending right now. So I can never put all of them aside just to handle the one. But what we do is uh, we fast track a lot of things. If you don't need to see me, in the next three weeks, you're not going to see me. You're going to go and schedule with my bailiff your next hearing, your next. But there are people that are locked up on like probation violations. They have to be heard. So in the morning, I will do those first, get them out of the way. And the lawyers will all be notified ahead of time. She's in trial on a capital case. Get in there. And, you know, we'll be able to start each day by hopefully about 10 o'clock. So that's how that goes. It gets really hairy when you get into a heavy civil case that goes for a very long time. They can last a couple of months. So that gets a little bit hectic, but uh, it's manageable. It's manageable. Yes, ma'am. Just curious, what was your most interesting case that you presided over? The, okay, as a judge? Uh -huh. Or as a lawyer? Um, as a lawyer, I would have to say it was that Del High case. Um, because we had, it was, it was something that it, movies are made out of. I mean, I, I, if it's too gross, I'll stop. But we went, the police went out to this home, and he, the defendant, the husband, I don't know, she's been missing, blah, blah, blah. I'll cut to the chase. We found stuff in the side yard that wasn't adding up, including a couple bottles of bleach. And the grass in the ground was real wet, and it had been a super dry summer. This was back in like 2010. And so the police called a forensic anthropologist, um, 
Murray is her name, I forget her first name, out at Mount St. Joe. And she came out, and she's out there, and it's like, I swear to you, it was like 100 degrees that day. And she's in pantyhose and a skirt. She hikes up her skirt, and she's walking around, and she's going, that's a bone fragment, that's fat gobules, that's bone, that's a, that's a femur chip right there. And we were like, oh my gosh. So all in the side yard, we collected up everything we could. The only portion of this woman's body that we were ever able to get, because we talked to the kids, ultimately when we figured out what was going on, the kids said, well, we went to Target over on Coleraine, and then we went to here and there. It was like we were chasing the Rumpke truck. And oh, the Rumpke truck was just here, the Rumpke truck. Rumpke was wonderful. They cordoned off the area where those trucks that service that part of town would dump. I mean, that's a held high tech of a, a system. You don't think about that. Yeah. They knew, but what they were able to narrow it down to is a football field size, 20 feet deep. Uh, Go ahead and dig. So we tried. And all we ever found was actually, and this is really wild too, the police went back before he was even in custody, but we knew that something was going on and this was prior to finding the bone chips and everything. The police went and looked in his garbage that he pulled out to the curb and dug around and they got to a garbage bag and it was really heavy and they could see that there was something in there. And it was the portion of her torso from here to oh, here. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and we were able to identify it. I mean, not only would we have gotten DNA, but she had a tattoo at the base of her spine and he had cut straight across the tattoo, so we had but then, then when we found the bone chips, we had, there's a, a, uh, a bone expert, and he's a tool, a tool mark expert up at Mercyhurst College. He's now actually down in Mississippi at the coroner's office. He came into the scene. We took that portion of her body and the chips, and like a puzzle, a couple of those bone chips fit onto what we had. So we knew that the crime was committed in the side yard of their home, right in Delhi, right on Greenwell Avenue in Delhi. But it was, it's a very dark, kind of the end of a long, long driveway. So that was, I mean, that is something movies are made of. And it was right here in Hamilton County. I'm still in touch with the family. Her, um, the deceased girl's parents took custody of these three kids. Two have cerebral palsy, and the other one is severe ADHD. And now these parents who, you know, were in their retirement years are raising these three, you know, children with problems on top of the fact of what they've endured. And so um, Delhi has been really great. We've had a lot of fundraisers for the family, and I still keep in touch with them and get updates on how the children are, go, are doing and everything. It's, it's a whole different, there is a whole different world and it's just amazing to me. It's fascinating the way that, that people live. It really is. Yes, Has he been executed? He was not facing the death penalty. Interesting, because to get the death penalty, you have to kill somebody in the commission of a felony. So um, I've, I, I've broken into your home. I've committed a burglary, that's a felony, and I murder you while I'm in there. That would be, a, that could be a capital murder case because we had no idea how she died. We could never prove how, did he shove her down the steps? Did he choke her out? Did, I, we have no idea of what happened. We just know that, and he never did confess. To this day, he still writes her mother letters saying the real killer's still out there. Um, because we couldn't prove that first element of how it happened, that first felony step in the murder, then it's not a capital murder case. He got 33 years to life. Does that explain why so many murderers of women and children do not get the death penalty? Um, a lot, it is, this is so counterintuitive to me like this case that I'm starting tomorrow, I, like I had said the victim is a two-year-old. It is very difficult to get a jury to convict, um, to find for death when the person who is dead is a child. Now, isn't that counterintuitive to you? You would think that that's like a no-brainer. But the thing that people, they've just, they, there are studies on this. People have a hard time wrapping their brain around the fact 
that a, because usually it's a parent that's charged, that a parent would intentionally murder their own child. Or a spouse. Or a spouse. And they have a hard time with that. So, again, having worked for Joe, I understand his logic behind it. He, he is very careful about when he charges the death penalty. He charges it when there is a chance of getting a death conviction. Um, so some cases get charged as straight murder. Now those people may still have life in prison without parole or with parole after a very long time, possibility of parole. Um, but as far as getting the death sentence, it's very rare. Does the jury first decide guilt or innocence and then is a separate hearing for the death penalty? Correct. They start almost simultaneously, usually because we don't want to torture the jury any longer. Usually once, if they've come back with um, the, the guilt phase, then we go into what's called the penalty phase. And there is a mini trial that's put on where um, both sides have, uh, or the defense offers a mitigation expert. Get up there and explain what a horrible life this person had and why they would do something so god awful. And actually, the defendant themselves in that second phase, that penalty phase, they're permitted to take the stand and make what's called an unsworn statement, which means they cannot be cross-examined by the state of Ohio. They can say whatever <coughs> they want. And then, you know, the state puts on, of course, the victim and their family and the police officers and whatnot to try Is to... Is the argue. same jury that hears this? Yes. Yes. And that's why we do it quickly. Is that, I mean, you could imagine being a juror how very emotionally draining it is just to sit on a death penalty case and decide the guilt innocence phase let alone now you're going to bring us back for another portion we need to get this over with so so when we start tomorrow i would anticipate a three weeks total about that this trial will go and that last week will be the, the penalty phase yes sir in, in the last 20 years how, how many people have been executed in the state of ohio Oh, none. I don't think any. So, I mean, we give it's, the death penalty, but nobody gets it. Right. Yeah. If Anthony Kirkland's was reversed, I mean, it, it is. It's, I hear you. It's still on the books, but um, it's impossible. It's very, very difficult. Yes, sir. Just one quickie. Uh, do you feel that, that the juries are manicured to, to be biased by how they're chosen? Oh, well, that's the whole point. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being smart, Alex, about it, but both sides, I mean, we get up there and they, they say, we want a fair and impartial jury. No, they don't. The state of Ohio wants people that are going to side with police and law enforcement in the state, and the defendants going to want people that feel sympathy and, you know, all this for the defense. So, okay, are, are they manicured for it one way or the other? No, because it is genuinely a random pulling of people. So we we start the day with a random pull, but then the lawyers through, and they only each get four challenges where they can just kick someone off for no reason, because I don't like what they said to that answer. Um, the, those lawyers are trying to stack the jury in their favor, of course. If not, then we would just take the first 12 with no questions asked. But that's why it's, it comes out as a, as a fair process is it is a random pool to begin with and then both sides get the equal number of challenges or they get to kick the same number of people off before we're, we have a jury. Once they run out of their excuses, they're done. How often do you find that everything's set to go to trial and then they take a plea minutes before for a, a settle? With criminal cases, um, I would say when it, it getting down to the wire like that like the juries in the hallway not as often as you would think it's often you know the jury's going to start on monday and the friday before their lawyer will call the court and say they want to plead um, because the lawyer also knows if the prosecutor spends the weekend preparing for that they're not likely not going to offer the deal anymore um civil cases though i, I mean we've had juries deliberating in civil cases plead yeah and here's the other thing, it's interesting to me. The civil cases become so much more contentious between the lawyers than the criminal. I mean, I've been in death penalty cases and I could go to dinner with opposing counsel in the middle of the trial and we would 
that'd be perfectly fine and we're friends. Boy, those civil lawyers, I think that they would shove each other down the steps given the opportunity <laughs> at times. Yeah, in, tr in trial, it is very time. intense. And that's interesting to me. It's like, okay, you're fighting over money versus somebody's liberty or their life. Yeah. And it's always very contentious, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, t taking what you've said about the death penalty, because I've, I've, this whole heroin epidemic, <clears throat> To me, it just seems logic that if we got the death penalty for heroin dealers, maybe it would help. But with what you're saying, it'd be almost impossible to get the death penalty. No, right, exactly. First of all, you would never get the legislation through to get the death penalty for a heroin dealer. It just, I mean, politically speaking, it just, I couldn't imagine that it would ever happen. I like how you think, but I can't imagine it would happen. And then on top of it, if, even if that law were instituted, it would be, I mean, if you can't get the death penalty, like I said, on Anthony Kirkland, who killed three women and tortured, and, you know, how do you, little less me, Kenny, 13 years old. That's, <coughs> they still try to get people who don't know a lot about cases, because it seems like recently with, with the internet and all the other information sources, the whole jury pool is going to know a lot about it. I, for instance, your case coming up with a Cincinnati police officer. I mean, that's been in the news for so much. How are you going to get a, a fair jury who hasn't been inundated with all this stuff? That's, that's a very good question. I get that a lot, actually, because there's a distinction that people don't realize. It doesn't matter if you've read everything that's ever come out on the case that you're called for as a juror. The question will be put to you, can you set aside what you have heard and seen in the media and base your decision solely on what you hear and the evidence you receive in this courtroom? And most people will say, well, okay, yeah, I can do that. That's how we get a fair jury. Because I've been getting that a lot with, aren't you going to have to move this case out of county? Um, because you're not going to be able to get 12 people in the box who haven't heard of it. Well, we're not looking for people that haven't heard. You just have to be able to put it all aside and just make your decision on what you receive in that courtroom. Do you think they're being honest, though, when they say they can put it aside? Or do you think they really, they want to get on that because they really feel that person is guilty and they want their chance? You'd be surprised. I, um, I had my, I was skeptical often uh, earlier on about the jurors and whether or not this is truly a, <coughs> jurors make a great effort to do the right thing by the rules that we tell them they have to play by. I'm always, it, it is so impressive to see on the inside how well our system works. It is not a perfect system, but it is by far <coughs> the best system because it, it's fascinating to talk to the jurors afterwards and they'll explain their rationale and how they came to the decision and I see it, you know, when, they, when they're back there deliberating for days on end. And, and it, so I, I do think that they really try their hardest. I've had cases where afterwards a couple of the jurors have said, well, there was this one who said that they wouldn't put aside their bias, that they don't like all whatever people, you know. And, and then you're like, oh, well, I mean, our system is not perfect, but 99% of the time I really do believe they, they, they are being honest. I've served on jury and it's so interesting. Isn't it? Yes, it's very interesting. I have. I always ask jurors, <coughs> did you try to get out of this, or when you got that summons, did you go, oh. And most people are, yeah, yeah. And then after, I will ask the jury that sat, now how do you feel about this? And they're like, this is, I have yet to have anybody say anything other than, this was fascinating, it was interesting, I'm so glad I did it, I'm so glad I didn't make up an excuse, I'm so yeah. glad I was picked. I don't want to do it every month, but I'm yeah. very glad I did it this time. Yeah. It, the system works. It really does. Maybe I have one more question. Here. She's going to go because she thinks I'm hogging the show here. But do you think the uh, public's attitude has changed towards the media in, in a trust way? The media's become so polarized and sensationally driven by sensation that that helps you get a, a, a jury who, who can say, I can put what I've heard in the newspaper and on TV aside. And, do the right thing? I think that yes and no. I think that more and more people are becoming educated to that, but still the majority of our community as a whole, Hamilton County, I, I would believe 
believe what they hear in the media is the truth, is fact. It's a sad but true thing. It's just, we live in kind of a little bubble when we're skeptical and we kind of dig to the bottom of things, but there aren't many people that do that. Uh, just to kind of follow up on the, the whole uh, heroin and the uh, penalty. Uh, yeah, it, it is uh, easy to feel as though, you know, everything is on the side of the drug dealer. You know, they, they're rewarded by finance, power, um, and then they're treated with soft gloves by the law. The question is, uh, it, it's, you know, it, you could want, are we really serious about dealing with this? And, uh, you know, can things get bad enough where we, we do take it serious and say, you know, that we, we need to hold people responsible for the, uh, the harm that they're causing? I think that um, the one thing with your statement that I would disagree is that drug dealers are kind of treated softly. If you come into most of the courts down there and you have drug trafficking charges, we're not even talking about somebody's died or overdosed or anything, you are a drug trafficker versus somebody, you are come, you come in with the same level of felony, but you possess for personal use. We actually, um, as judges, I've seen, will push to get the person who is a user into treatment if they want it, they have to want it. The drug dealer who is making a living goes to prison. So they're already, um, there's a distinction there based on the charges, and I feel it, at least what I, all I can speak, I guess, is what I do and what I've seen as a prosecutor, is the drug traffickers are treated more harshly. Now, the question is how harsh is it going to get, how harsh do we need to get to fix the problem or put a dent in the problem, and it always comes back to money. We don't have the prison <coughs> capacity to hold every drug trafficker as much as we would like to. Taxpayer dollars. Okay, one more question. If you're found guilty, though, and they have all this money. We take Can't it. You, yeah, you take it, and that could not be used to pay for them to stay in for a long time? Well, what it is is it's forfeited, and by law, it goes, about three quarters of it goes to the police department, mm -hmm. and about one quarter to the prosecutor's office, mm -hmm. and it's put into a particular fund that can only be used for particular things. We, I mean, we, there would have to be a different mechanism in the law to take it to dump it into the prison system. Right now, it's still used for very good things. We can use it for training purposes within the, the police department, um, for buying equipment, stuff like that. It can never be used for raises, for monetary gain, for the employees of the police department, but it can be used to um, better the police. So, something. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you.